Fiction and reality. New stories, new ideas. Little Beth Entertainment. Hey, welcome to the Model Rocket Show at themodelrocketshow.com. This is your host, the Rocket Noob. And we got a new episode with Chris Michelson, model rocket builder extraordinaire. He builds models for Estes and Quest. He builds their show models and their their dis- well, their display models and their catalog models, really, uh, which is pretty cool. He writes a blog called The Model Rocket Building Blog, which if you haven't checked it out, you really owe it to yourself to do so because he's got a lot of tips on there. He's been building rockets for years, and he can help you build some really nice-looking model rockets. And I know what some of you are thinking, Noob, uh, what happened to the old uh, the, 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 the Field Notes 2020 episodes we were listening to? Well, guys... Uh, I loaded up uh, part two, all the audio I had recorded, everything I had done in the second half of the year, last year, as far as launches, and I had over eight hours of audio. And I don't know, maybe eight hours doesn't sound like that much to cut down, but I had to listen to all of it. It was a lot of just me walking around, crunch, crunch, crunch. And uh, so I loaded it up. I was chopping, I was chopping, I was cutting. I got to what I thought was... Almost the end of the first half of the show, and I zoomed out to see how much track I had left, and I barely made a dent. So basically, the idea was a little too ambitious for the time I had. I mean, this was supposed to be two episodes I was going to release last year at Christmas and New Year's. And now it's May, and it is, it's nearly halfway through 2021. So I think Field Notes 2020, it's a little late for that episode. But I still have a lot of great field recordings, and I think what I'm going to do is I'm, we're just going to take little highlights of, of stuff and, and put it at the ends of shows as little Easter eggs at the end. Um, not at the end of this episode. Don't You don't have to wait for it at the end of this episode because it's been too long. I want to get this episode out to you. So we're going to talk to Chris Michelson, and it's going to be great. But I'd like to thank the Rocketry Forum at rocketryforum.com. The Model Rocket Show thanks rocketryforum.com for their support. This is L. Corinth. That's my username on there. I wasn't really thinking of Rocket Noob at the time. I should have gone with Rocket Noob, but I wasn't trying to do any marketing at the time. I've been a member since 2014 when I first got started in the hobby. The Rocketry Forum is a global community of rocketeers who openly discuss all aspects of hobby rocketry. So if you have a question, hop on there and ask. There are hundreds of experts who can answer just about any rocketry question you have. Check them out today at rocketryforum.com. All right, so let's check in and talk to Chris Michelson in five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to the Model Rocket Show, a podcast that is all about low and mid power model rockets. Like the ones you buy at hobby stores and fly in a park. And now, here is your host, Daniel the Rocket Noob. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Model Rocket Show at themodelrocketshow.com. It's me, the Rocket Noob, and our guest is Chris Michelson. Now, Chris, if you don't know, uh, writes a blog, a very fantastic blog on model rocketry. It's called the Model Rocket Building Blog. You can find it at modelrocketbuilding.blogspot.com. If you're listening to the show, you're probably familiar with the blog, but if you have not read it, you really owe it to yourself to check it out. It's fantastic. You learn a lot. It's mostly builds, and Chris, does, Chris is a craftsman. Uh, Chris, welcome. Hey, thank you. Good to be here. Uh, Chris, you are a craftsman. You definitely helped me when I first got involved in the hobby because I've only been doing this for about seven years. Um, And if you've got a rocket that you're working on, especially something that's kind of complicated, you just go to his website, modelrocketbuilding.blogspot.com. Go to the search box, and he's odds are he's already built it. And he's going to have, like, if you've got a, a Mercury Redstone, that's one that I really needed help with or the saturn 5 s to saturn 5 odds are he's built it so chris uh first of all thank you for coming on the show sure good to be with you and thanks for writing this blog it was really helpful to me it's been helpful to me over the years um why don't you tell us a little bit about your background my background, I know I talked about my history in model rocketry. I've got you beat. I celebrated my 50th year in rocketry about a year and a half ago. Of course, I didn't. I went from 13, age 13, to 20, 21. 
heavily involved with model rocketry, going to the NARAMs and meeting all the right people. Yeah. Surprisingly, those same people are still flying competition at the NARAMs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, we all go to the NARAMs to see how old we all are now. Uh, yeah. But it's it's surprising how many contacts you made back in the you know back in the seventies are now the CEOs and the VPs of operation of the major vendors right now. Maybe it's not too surprising. But uh, at twenty one, I decided to go and be a musician on the road. I'd go into the hobby stores and check out the Estes products or Centuri products, see what was still available, and did that for forty years. And when the interesting age discrimination thing, I was on the cruise ships, and I'm going to be 65 next month. When I had a slowdown, when I was working the cruise ships, I was you know, working as a headliner with the band backing me up, doing a full-blown show, uh, maybe about 2006, 2007. And things would slow down. They'd change formats, and I wouldn't get as many bookings. That's when I got back into the rocketry. Uh, 2009, I started the blog, and I'd be going on getting bookings on cruises. It would go, like I said, in in spurts. I did about 250 cruises over 10 years. Uh, I would build cardstock models up in my room because I'd been to every port in the Caribbean, so the rocketry kind of kept me going, and I would try and do posts dealing with very slow internets on the ships. And a couple of years ago, I just said to heck with it. I was tired of trying to book the act and trying to get, they're going with younger and younger entertainers. Yeah. And I, I just decided to go with the rocketry full time. And I haven't touched a banjo in three years. I play a lot of piano and I build a lot of rockets right now. My, I'm a single guy, so my kitchen table is where I build my rockets. I always see these very fancy, clean workshops, you know, where guys have got every little bottle and can of paint and it's marked with a Dymo letter, letter maker. Well, they wouldn't, <laughs> they couldn't identify with my kitchen table. Well, how many rockets do those guys actually build? I think those are... Do you want to know, I, I, I mentioned this to CG when we were testing microphones. Right now, I just got, I probably built 35 models, maybe 30 models for Estes. Yeah, And I've started building for Quest maybe in February. I've done two blocks of kits for Quest. Uh, the Estes rockets, um, I just built two of the dark ones, which is mm -hmm. the one that's kind of a conical shape. It looks like the X-24 bug, the old Centuri yeah. lifting body. Built two of those. I'm working on the Super Mars Snoopers right now, building three of those. And then I've got two more Antars to build. And I don't know where those are going. I built four Antars already. Mm -hmm. uh, the Antar is going to be featured on the blog, the whole build, step by step. Plus, I'm going to make available to my Patreon supporters a masking pattern and also a decal placement pattern, which is really needed in the kit. I mean, you could do it without it, but it will help. Yeah. Uh, so as soon as I get... Soon as Estes releases the Antar, which should be any day, I believe, I'll start start the build on the blog. So I've got three Mars Snoopers. The first two, the lifting body looking ones, the dark dark ones, went already went out and they've been they've been received by Estes. The Mars Snoopers are in progress, and I got an order from Quest for eighteen builds. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. So I've got like. Three of those cobalts. I build one is for catalog and two for flight. That's standard for Quest right now. Yeah. I'm also building some of the the new Quest is going to be bringing back some designs that are going to be built for their 24 millimeter Q jet uh, engines. The new That's ones that exciting. are going to come. Yeah, so we've had to revise the old 18 millimeter Icarus for a 24 millimeter engine mount, which wasn't really a problem. That's been done. Yeah, so I've I've got a lot of kits in the works, and then today from I just got orders from John Rocket, so I'll be <laughs> bagging up kits, making a lot. I already did tonight about fifty sets of Ray Springs. So it's it's I actually go from about ten in the morning until twelve o'clock at night building wow. kit production. It's just me, yeah, and it's to the point 
it took 10 years for auto rockets to get to the point where it's almost to where I would have to rent some space for all the inventory and have somebody working with me on it. And I don't know if I'm going to go that route or not. I may yeah. have to cut the product line down. So yeah, it's been an interesting, interesting day. I've got plans for other kits. I've got the F-18 Hornet auto rockets. Mm-hmm. I should be bringing out, but I can't have enough time to work on the instructions. You kind of slipped into auto rockets here. So let's go ahead and and talk about yeah. that. So Auto Rockets is your your personal line of kits. Right. Your your model your little model rocket company. And uh let's just go ahead and give the website for that too. It's Auto Rockets, which is O D D L Rockets, like odd little rockets, I assume. Well, it was like taking the word model rockets, dropping the mm-hmm. M and adding a D. So it's they're model yeah. rockets, but they're odd. So it's oddle. There's no apostrophe in the website right. address. Autorockets.com will take you to a, basically it's a blog site. Blogs are easier to edit than an actual website would be. So Yeah, and we'll put the link to the to both of these sites in the in the show notes at Model Rocket oh, show, at the Model Rocket Show.com. Yeah, of course, absolutely. Um, so the, tell us about, first of all, why did you start Auto Rockets? What 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 did you want to do different? And what makes uh, two of the two of the probably the most iconic ones you do are the little green man and Pegasus, which is a flying pig. <laughs> um, <laughs> great, funny, humorous <laughs> rockets. Um, but you have a number of them. You have so you, you've had some Goonies. I think you've got a uh, um, a birdie like a, a shuttlecock uh, yeah. birdie, um, and some and now some some planes. So tell us wh- what made you want to do that and, and how has it gone and, and what makes Auto Rockets different from other companies? Yeah, they've got to be models that are out of the ordinary. It's not a three fin nose cone rocket. Even our breakaway kit, which is based kind of on the Estes Wacky Wiggler, only mine, the connections are stronger on my breakaway. It looks like a three-fin nose cone rocket going up, but when at the ejection charge, it breaks into six separate seconds or sections that serpentine down to the ground, and it falls horizontally. It's weighted such that it won't come down nose or fins first. It lands on its side. So it does serpentine on the way down. Uh, the rockets that were always fun for me and always kind of raised an eyebrow if I went to a club launch were the Birdie and the Sputnik, which were first two of the first two kits I came out with. Um, and I always wanted to come out with the accessories that I really found helpful growing at, you know, as a teenager. The Century had the springs that hold your rocket up on yeah. a launch rod. So I've got those being custom made for me. Uh, I still have to bend and cut the tube and connect the tube to the spring, but the springs are custom made. So that it'll slide down the rod with a two-finger pinch. But when you set a rocket on it, the weight of the rocket locks the spring onto the rod. So there's very, very tight tolerances. Yeah. I had ceramic blast deflectors for a long while, but the man that was making them for me passed away. And the last batch he made were not really sellable. They were pretty rough. That's That's the joy of vendors. If anybody wants to come out with their own rocket company, standardize everything it's just easier standardize and deal with bt tubes and make all your launch lugs two inches long instead of having five different lengths of launch rod launch lugs that sort of thing yeah i getting back to auto rockets um i always hated getting down on my knees to connect up the micro clips so I came up with something that was based on Larry Brown took an old uh, Centuri SkyTrack altitude tracker, which was more like a surveyor's uh, tripod. But I came up with something that I can adapt and screw onto the camera. The screw, you can put a camera, mount a camera on a tripod, and you can lock a 3 inch or a 1 8 inch. You can't do a quarter inch because you don't want to model that heavy on a plastic tripod anyway. But right. that was really a game changer. That's called the adapter. Yeah, and, I have one of those. And you've that used was, it with success? Oh yeah, yeah. I've I I that was one of the first, I guess, accessories that I bought that wasn't just an Estes kit. Um, yeah. you know, I had my eye on it and I thought, well, I'm I don't like these little squat little launch pads <laughs> and I have a, you know, I have a I have a tripod that 
it doesn't really raise and lower the way I want it to anymore, but it's still a tripod and yeah. just having that. And plus I needed, I wanted something that'll, that would hold a three sixteenths inch launch rod and right. I couldn't really, I mean, I, you know, I, I'd seen plans for launch pads and things, but I was like, I don't, I don't know how to make this stuff. I'm, I was new at this. And yeah. so I bought that bought the adapter and it was great. And I just stuck a, basically stuck a blast deflector between it and the screw and just screwed it yeah. down and, uh, and works great. And you could just pick the whole thing up, you know, with the little handle on the side of the tripod. Um, you know, you can tilt it, you can raise Simplicity. the legs if you want to. Yeah. Yeah. Simplicity is, is a wonderful thing. I try and keep my stuff as simple as I can. So the few um, accessories have been very successful. Uh, those little ray springs, I wouldn't recommend somebody buying a 10 pack and giving them out at a club launch because kids will, don't know how to use them and they'll get, you know, there's a possibility they can get something caught on them. You have to know how to set them up. But uh, I'm, I'm in the process right now of upgrading some of the kits. Uh, I took a tip from Shrox on my jet fighters, my fighter jet series. I've got an F-16 mm-hmm. or an F-104 Starfighter now, and the F-18 is coming, the Hornet. Um, I work with a gentleman named David Koo, who lives close by in Orlando, and he's the guy that did that 3D-printed N-1 Russian moon rocket. Yeah. Beautiful work. I mean, this guy knows how to do 3D printing. And he printed up these missiles for my fighter jets, which is something I was missing. I was just using a launch log that was cut tapered. The tip was tapered, kind of the way yeah. Quest did on their uh, Escort. I think it was called a QS-1 Escort kit. It looks like a missile was on the wing. But I wanted to get something that was closer to the old Centuri fighter fleet design. And he printed these things up using an SLA printer, which there's no ridges on these SLA printers, not like a PLA. I hope I got those letters right. But Someone he, will tell us if you didn't. <laughs> sure. Well, it's all new to me. I, I yeah. think I'm half tempted to get a printer. 3D printing has come a long way. Yeah. And it needed to. I was never happy with all the ridges and all the filling and cleaning up you had to do with the parts. Anyway, so... I've got missiles I'll be adding to the next orders of fighter jet kits and that will be part of the F-16, not the F-104, but the F-16 will have two missiles on the wingtips. And I'm just working out a deal with Randy at, at E-Rockets to get a hold of more ST-18 tubing for my Pegasus and my Little Green Man. And I'm starting to work with a flying robot that'll be the size of the pig and the little green man using the same style nose cone. But he's going to have a clear plastic top, kind of like the robot, Robbie the robot from the 50s. A little like that. I haven't really messed with it a lot yet, but that's another model I could bring to the table, I think, that would be a a lot of fun that'll actually fly. And, and some of these, like the the Pegasus and the Little Green Man, I mean, you, I, you look at them and you you wonder, uh, you know, how how they fly. I think it's a little bit like when people see the the uh, the Fliss kits, the, oh, the, the Acme. Um, Acme the Acme Spitfire, and they think, oh, that yeah. that's not going to fly <laughs> fly right, but they do. They do fly quite well, I'm sure. Well, I've never ran my Pegasus or my Little Green Man through any rock sim stability checks. I've never done string testing with my fighter jets. It's kind of like, and I'm not comparing myself to John Boren, whose work is just amazing. Design and builds are beyond, you know, he, he does beautiful work for Estes. He said he doesn't do any rock sim simulations. Mm-hmm. He just builds them and flies them. And that's pretty much what I do. And that, that's pretty exciting when you put a C-65 in an F-104 Starfighter and kind of cross your fingers and ask for a heads up at a club lunch. Yeah, But it flew with a C-65. I was lucky to get it back because it really, it really took off. It really took off, yeah. Well, they're BT-50 heavy wall. I use heavy wall BT-50. That's another thing I had done with for auto rockets. All the engine mounts have heavy wall BT-20 tubing in them now. Yeah. Uh, Because I really, BT-50s and 20s, the walls are too thin on those tubes, so I wanted to upgrade. So hopefully the rockets will last longer and not crimp like the 22 models sometimes and 50 models sometimes do. 
But yeah, I'm working on a lot of, not a lot, but some really good product upgrades for my kits. I have plans <laughs> uh, for, for other things, but it's just a case of getting time to do it right now. Yeah. So it, it can be hard. It can be hard for the single person operation uh, to keep up uh, with that kind of stuff. Well, I kind of know why people get in and out of the business. It's really yeah. exciting bagging up those first 20 kits. But when you get into five or 600, you know, after a while, you're, you're looking at it going, oh, criminy, here we go again. But when you see a, when you see a post on Facebook uh, where somebody is, their kids have gotten into the hobby because of one of your models, or I can't believe this thing actually flew, that's what's rewarding. And to be able to build for Estes and Quest, I mean, that's, I jokingly say that's a 13-year-old's dream come true. It, it really is. That's something I've always yeah. wanted to do was work for a manufacturer. I was close back about 1976. No, it was 78, 79. I was up for consideration with R&D at Centuri uh, with two other guys, and I didn't get the job. And that kind of set me back on a path to the banjo. Yeah. <laughs> A path straight to musical hell. <laughs> but it's been an interesting ride and I've kind of come back full circle. So I, you know, I I'm I really feel I'm 64. I really feel like I'm heading into the most production productive years of my life right now. Yeah. Good place to be. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, you know, that that sounds the, building models for Estes and Quest sounds like such a cool gig. Um, it and is? I think it's a real, it's a, well, it's a real testament to, to your craftsmanship that they came to you to ask you to put these together for their catalogs or for display, uh, for show. And I've, I've actually at, at Narcon a couple of years ago, I got to see some of your kits close up and I mean, it's one thing to see them on, on the internet, uh, uh which I've been reading your blog for years, but it's another to actually see them in person. And some of these rockets, like. You know, I've seen you, you've built a the little Fliss Kits Mercury Redstone, which had all these tiny little paper transitions and Dr. Zoot kits. And, a, yeah, that was a Dr. Zoot Saturn. Was that or, a Dr. Me, Zoot? Mercury. Yeah, I brought to the Saturn V, the Zoot Saturn V, which is one of my favorite builds. Yeah. Plus yeah. the Zoot Mercury Redstone. I think it was the BT50 version he tiny. came out with. Yeah, it was, it was the 50 version. Yeah. And I just saw I, it and I thought, I don't know if I would want to do that, but it was beautiful. Well, it comes down to a lot of experience. Uh, uh, getting back to building for Estes, it mm -hmm. is very rewarding and, quite, and very flattering to be recognized. Because um, when you're at a club launch, people go, oh, what a nice rocket, but they don't know what went into it. Right. So it is, it is gratifying to be asked to do that. But the problem is everything you want it to be perfect. Yeah. And it's never perfect. I mean, right. I, I mentioned this on the blog. I said, you know where the scars are. You know where the glue blobs are. Oh, the definitely. Average yeah. Personally won't know that or won't notice it unless you show them. So I just don't show anybody. <laughs> but I've developed over the years a real, it's not a production line, but I've developed a lot of shortcuts. And the main thing is, doing a clean build and surface preparation before you spray the paint and cross your fingers. Right. We're heading into humid summers again in Florida and yeah. it, it's a crapshoot. Yeah. Um, we, we are lucky up here in New England. We have low uh, humidity, but we do have wind. I'm, I'm fortunate that I live in a townhouse, one of my bedrooms mm -hmm. upstairs, which used to be one of my daughter's rooms when they, when they stayed over with me. Now it's the rocket room. And I mean, maybe 100 built rockets and lots of boxes with supplies and pieces and parts for the kits. But I've, I've got a patio with eight foot tall walls, which work as a windbreak for me. Yeah. So I can spray. I lay down a big piece of cardboard to pick up any drips because I don't want them to go on my paper bricks that I've got in my patio. Right. But I put on a mask and I pretty much just spray. Right now I'm using, and I hate to recommend paint. <laughs> I, I, right, I, love, I love paint recommendations, so go ahead. <laughs> yeah, but they keep changing the formulas and people I say, know, you ruined too. my rocket. I didn't ruin I anybody's know. rocket. Uh, Rust-Oleum 
white is problematic because of the concentration of, I understand, powdered titanium in it, which yeah. makes it the, yeah. the bright white. And what that does is it settles. And if it settles near that intake straw at the bottom, even if they have an intake straw, whatever the intake is at the bottom of the can, that's what shoots out cottage cheese. Yeah. And if you spray that on a vacuform wrap Saturn V, you've got a lot of cleanup to do. It's a mess. Oh, yeah. Yes, it is. I, I have, uh, I've used, I mean, I've used, I used to use Rust-Oleum 2X exclusively, and then I started getting cottage cheese. There are some colors that I really like and then others that I will never touch. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't go near the Rust-Oleum gloss white. The Rust-Oleum metallics are very good. It look, The word metallic is on the label, but they spray out such a fine, fine metallic. You don't want to breathe that in. You got to wear, now that everybody has got masks, wear a mask when you spray. The yeah. Rust-Oleum metallics are very good. The midnight silk black metallic is spectacular for canopies and that sort of thing. Right now, David Siggs builds on Rocketry Forum, and he recommended to me the Krylon White Industrial Acrylic. It's not Krylon yeah. you get at Walmart, but the Krylon Industrial, you can order it through Granger. Through and, Granger, I'm gonna I'm gonna write yeah. that down because uh, paint has been a, an issue for me lately, and I actually. Oh. I actually, uh, there there are a couple of formulas. I know a lot of people complain about Krylon, but there were a couple of formulas of Krylon in recent years that I've really enjoyed. And one of them was called Color Master. And now I can only find something called Color Max. And um, no. it's, I hate it. I hate it. I hate I Color don't Max. Know, I don't know if it's the FDA. Basically, when you buy paint at a, at a hardware store, you're, they're selling to a housewife that wants to spray a planter. Or yeah. sprayer furniture for the next Some summer wicker season. furniture, yeah. Yeah. And it's not meant for rocketry. The paint, like I said, I use white. This, like I said, David Siggs, if you ever see his builds, he's a clean mm -hmm. builder. And he recommended to me, and I thank him for it, this, uh, the Krylon Industrial through Granger. You may pay a little more, but it's not that much more. But right. my gosh, you know, if, if it's going to save you the time and having to re-sand a whole model, it's well worth it. The other paint, uh, I've been getting paint from Ace Hardware Premium Enamels. Now that, that I was going to say that before I, let me backtrack a little bit, that Krylon Industrial has got the old style spray can, fingertip sprayer, you know, where you press down. Yeah. Man, you've, you've got to engage. If you just go lightly, it'll shut off. So you have to engage that sprayer underneath your, that nozzle underneath your finger. The Ace Hardware Premium Enamel has got one of those spray tips where you can turn the little white nozzle on it, go for wide to narrow. Just leave it where it is. And I've yeah. had very good luck with the Ace, the other colors. I haven't used their white enough to give a give a, a recommendation on it. But like I said, the, the Rust-Oleum Metallic, it's got to say metallic, and they only have five or six colors. They've got a gold yeah. and a black, kind of like a midnight black, which looks like a star field under bright sunlight. They've got a red that's hard to find. They've got a blue metallic and a silver metallic. Those have been great, but they spray on so light, you think you're not getting any coverage. You just have to do mist coats with that stuff. I tend to go with the old Centuri adage of light mist coats, sanding between coats, and you sand. That's when you sand down your fillets and get rid of your glue boogers that mm -hmm. always show up. As careful as you can be, they're going to be there. And I sand with old 400 grit sandpaper. New 400 will leave scratch marks. Yeah. So sometimes, here's a tip for you. Sometimes what I do, because 800 won't even lift the stuff, you know, won't even clean up the area. I'll take two pieces of 400 grit and put them face to face, rough side to rough side, and just go back and forth with the two pieces of sandpaper. Rough just to, to rough. Take off some of the say, take off some of the grit. It takes off some of the high points. And that will give yeah. you like a 600 grit sand. If you don't do it too much, you're just going to end up with paper. But yeah. if you just do a few passes 
and cover, you know, like try and get the ends and edges on it. It gets rid of all the high points if there is high points. I'm sure if you looked at it under a microscope, you'd see some stones, some so- some sand sanding stones that are higher than others. Oh, definitely. It's yeah. Not, yeah, but this gets rid of that and it gives you a little finer sandpaper without getting into 800 or 1,000 or 1,200 or 15. When I was building yeah. banjos, before I would polish them out, I would go to up to 2,000 grit sandpaper, mm-hmm. which, feels, which feels like you're just hitting it with a piece of copy paper. But all, it's weird to think when you're sanding, you're basically just roughing up the surface finer and finer and finer. And people say, how do you get such a good finish? Well, it's surface preparation, doing a clean build, and sanding down to the equivalent of maybe a 600 grit. If you go any finer than that, the paint doesn't have a tooth to hold it, right. to hold on the surface. And that's when you spray and you lift up your masking tape and you might pull up paint. I would say 400. Mm-hmm. An old piece of 400 grit is real good. And my big tip that I've mentioned 10 times, I repeat myself on the blog because I'm a guy and I finally understand the rules like when I was married for 18 years that if I hear it the fourth time, I might go, oh, okay, you know, (laughs) typical guy. So I repeat stuff on the blog, but if you get one of these soft wire brushes and run it under water and you can clean all that buildup off your sandpaper and that's where you get the sandpaper that's good to sand between surf, between uh, paint springs. Where where were we at? Well, like, get off well you know, and it's not it's not a, also <laughs> with a with a blog. I mean, I I haven't really published anything on my blog in a long time. I just haven't felt like writing, I guess. But um, but I always found that you never know if somebody's reading one entry, they're they're not necessarily going to have read the whole thing. So it's really, especially if you're writing for beginners, you know, or writing to give people advice, it's good to repeat those things because they, you know, they don't know, even if it is somewhere else on your blog, they don't, they're don't. they not going to know where to find it and they may not have seen it. So um, yeah. I always find that kind of stuff really helpful. Well, um, I've been but- doing at least one blog post, sometimes two posts a day for over 10 years. And that's a lot of posts. Yeah. And you There's always a lot think- to read on there. Well, it's almost too much. It's kind of overwhelming. I've taken a jazz piano course right now, and this guy's got so many courses available, I don't know where to start. But hopefully with the blog, you can do a search and come up with something. But the builds are always from finished model, scrolling back to beginning. And that's just the way the blogs are set up. The blog's got a symbiotic, that's the word I always forget, a symbiotic relationship with auto rockets and doing custom builds for other vendors and and customers. So one thing supports another. Mm -hmm. And that was another way I looked at it. And I'm kind of like, I was so surprised as a kid when you see an interview of Charles Schultz, who with Peanuts, the guy who drew Peanuts all those years, they ask him how many he's got ready to go, ready to be printed. He said, I have 65 comic strips ready to go to press if need be. Mm -hmm. Because if you hit a dry spell, or if I was on a cruise ship, I had to set those up so they would drop down at 1201 the next day. Yeah. If I wasn't. So I kind of handle it like that. I've got 60 or so blog posts that I could post. Sometimes they go outdated. Sometimes it doesn't even apply anymore. But yeah. I try and try and do at least one, maybe two posts a day. And I was doing, oh, look who's got this new kit available. But I don't like doing that necessarily because it, I don't, I don't want to show uh, preferential treatment. I try and build from all the active vendors if I right. can. Plus, build a vintage kit here and there. Or, but the big thing right now is I'm waiting for that Antar to drop for sale because that's <laughs> going to be. That's going to be a big kit for Estes. It's it's a beautifully designed model. It's it's a challenge. It hits all the bases. It's not a beginner's kit, but boy, does it hit all the bases. It's sci-fi. It's got history behind it. It's a good size model. It's an 18 millimeter, so it's not going to get away from you. And it's just a sharp looking model with an interesting paint pattern. I think it's going to yeah. be big. 
And as soon as they say it's for sale, you'll see it on the blog. So Yeah, I'm looking at a picture of it right now. It's pretty cool. Yeah, painting that, look at the wing on it. It's got that, um, yeah. And the, here's your tip of the day, and I mentioned this on the blog. To match the decal color, the green decal, the best, and that's what I do. I go in with decal sheets into the hardware stores, and I match up the paint, which is sometimes, I get it close, but not exact. Yeah, uh, Forest tough. green, Ace Hardware Forest Green is a perfect match for those dark green decals on the decal sheet. That's gonna so, be a big. That's gonna be a big kit there. That's gonna be a pretty uh, awesome kit. Yeah, I think the dark <laughs> kit. All the stuff they're coming out with right now is is reminiscent of older older designs or kind of throwbacks. And where do you see the retro box on the? I mean, there's people gonna put that on their wall in a frame. It's really oh, yeah. retro fifties kind of you know like kind of like Disneyland Moonlander that mod, yeah. that rocket that used to be outside of Flight to the Moon. Uh, it's kind of reminiscent of all that era, you know, in the art and the presentation. So pretty, pretty cool. Let's take a little break and talk about our sponsor, eRockets.biz, your home for unique model rocket kits, as well as the world's largest selection of rocket parts from SEMROCK. In business since 2009, eRockets doesn't just stock many of your favorite in production kits. They also produce their own versions of popular out of production models, many of you have come to enjoy over the years. There are also plenty of other new and reissue model rocket kits to choose from. eRockets.biz certainly has enough kits to keep you busy building rockets for a long time to come. And since we are talking to the creator of Auto Rockets, let's talk about the Auto Rockets you can pick up on eRockets. So first of all, we've got the Pegasus and the Little Green Man. These are some odd rocks. They're very cool looking. They're very fun. Great rockets for, for kids. Uh, a bit of a challenging build, but they are very cute. The rocket, the pig rocket looks like a pig with little angelic wings and some flying goggles and the little green man is a little alien uh, they do fly well and they're going to turn some heads at your next launch there are some new fighter plane models you've got the f-16 as well as the f-104 starfighter and those are some really cool looking fighter jet style rockets some more odd rocks you might check out are the sputnik and the birdie which is uh, sort of like a shuttlecock from uh, from badminton and it looks exactly like that and it flies great because obviously a shuttlecock is is nice and stable and doesn't go too high because of the drag if you're looking for some some accessories you might also check out the adapter which is a very simple little device you can use to transform any uh, camera tripod into a launch pad so if you want to get up off your knees for those muddy days you want to use a tripod you just screw this on there Add a little uh, blast deflector, and it'll do the trick for thirteen ninety nine. You can get all this and more at erockets.biz. So check out erockets.biz today to learn more. Erockets.biz. If rocketry scares you, buy a train set. Daniel loves your model rocket questions. If you have any, send them to noob at themodelrocketshow.com. That's N zero zero B at themodelrocketshow.com. Now back to Daniel. Have you ever had a, a build that just wouldn't go right for you? <laughs> uh, yeah. Dumb question. <laughs> no, no. I hate it on the blog if I'm building something and I throw in the towel. <laughs> there, There's the old Estes Klingon ship. Uh, they came out with an Enterprise and they came out and the Enterprise had this big tube off the front end of it. It was horrible. Yeah. I shouldn't say it was horrible. It was a nice display model. And I could see why they did it the way they did. It was vacuformed for, you know, of course, weight and detail. But I ordered, I used to build, before I started building for the vendors, I, I used to build two models. I'd keep one and I'd sell one on eBay. But I was building two. I got a hold of two of the old boxed Estes Klingon ship, whatever they call that thing. And between body tube fits and vacuum form part fits around curved parts and balsa. And oh, I, I honestly threw in the towel and I said, I wonder if this is going to be worth the effort. And I built it when I was in my late teens. I remember yeah. building that thing. 
and I built an enterprise, but I don't have them now to see what they how well I built them. Right. That one I threw in the towel. There's one that I would love to build, but I just is the uh, Altera N1, mm-hmm. which looks like a big cardstock N1 moon rocket, the Russian one that I mentioned. Uh, David Koo has got his 3D printed one. This is one that was built with all cardstock shrouds. It's going to be a it's a it's a tough build, but yeah, I think that, that looks. It, looks it like would a be a very build. entertaining build. I think it would be great for the blog, and I bought it at the auction at the <laughs> Narum 60. It's the only thing I bought at Narum, but it's one of those ones I'm just going to have to have a clean kitchen table and a lot of time and maybe a new, a new flash card in my camera. And <laughs> to answer any people say, why don't you do video? Because I'd have to set up a studio setting. Yeah. I would have to do video editing. Uh, you'd have to have different cameras that set at different am- a- angles and A-B switching. And I just, Tim, at, you know, Tim Van Milligan does it beautifully. And it's yeah. a nice production. And I think you'd have to do a very nice production uh, to have it come off well. But the blog, I can sit down in an hour's time and do seven or eight blog posts. Photo editing composite photographs, picture in picture. I've gotten very quick at blogging. I know it's old school to blog, but it's a whole lot easier than video. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I've, I've shot, I've tried to shoot build videos and, and they went well up to a certain point And then I, I just, things were out of frame and I'd already finished yeah. building what I built. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. well, I'm, I'm not going to build another one. I'm not going to sit here and re, you know, readjust my camera and, you know, and only had one camera at the time. And, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, I've, I've got, I'm trying to work on, on setting things up now so that I can do that kind of stuff, but it it takes a lot more time. Yeah. You have to, you have to do multiple takes or else you're just, it's just a single static shot that most people aren't going to want to watch. And if you get your arm in the way, then you miss some key part of the build. And (laughs) that's what happened with when I was doing tube fill, I was doing tube spiral filling, for this this rocket i was i was videotaping the whole thing and i was posting everything to youtube and then i was like and here's how you fill in the tube spirals and i i did that and my head my stupid <laughs> head was in the way the whole time i had this camera set up so that you could look down at my workspace i was really proud of the way i had set up this rig that yeah. I, you, I could shoot straight down and so i'm like doing this and then i watched the whole thing and you, you just see the back of my head the whole time and it's like, yeah, people, well, I'm not going to finish this. <laughs> people take it for granted. I do yeah. have, uh, I do and appreciate my Patreon support. And I've got advertising on the blog to help, you know, pitch in. Because I don't make a lot of money from the Estes and, send, and Quest builds. I don't ask a lot because I know there's going to be models lost, broken up in transit. Uh, and I, I don't have to. I'm in a good place lifestyle wise and income wise i'm i'm okay and i'm just doing it for fun and this is kind of my job but yeah. i do invite patreon support and advertiser support makes all the difference and i know i've got like i said with this antar you're going to want that masking and decal placement templates to make your build much easier cuz boy i find if i'm sitting and swearing at a rocket it's a hard build. Yeah. It's like when you're masking a Saturn V or a Saturn 1B into about four hours, that's when I'm swearing at the model, and that's when I've got to set it down. So yeah. you, you will need to save yourself that and, not, and don't have to explain to your kids what words you just said. You are going to want the, <laughs> the masking templates. So, yeah, it's an adventure. It's, it's gone from a part-time thing to a full-time I mean, beyond full-time, more than eight hours a day. But it's still enjoyable. I still love going yeah. to going to a club launch and seeing one of my auto rockets. You always kind of wince like, I hope this goes well. <laughs> and when they fly successfully, you breathe that sigh of relief and you, know, and you realize why you're doing it. So, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, I may be doing some instructions. Uh, I, I worked. I, w- I was very fortunate as a teenager to be a uh, an understudy to a 
paste up in graphic artists in a print shop. So I've got a good graphic arts background. I might be doing some instruction work for Quest for some models they're going to be bringing back. I can't see anything more than that, except the ones that they're, you know, the, the, I mentioned the Icarus. That was already posted that they're bringing that one back. Quest is coming out with new packaging. They're updating a lot of their product to go along with their, you know, their new QJet composite engines. Have you launched a yeah. composite yet? Oh yeah, I mean I've launched I mean I've launched some a uh, couple of QJets. I've got yeah, I'm I'm I've done Aerotech and and Cesaroni and yeah, I love them. I I managed to get a hold of some old Quest black powder motors which is I was really happy about because uh Did those, you get the Chinese or the German made? Do they have the they, the they, they were, they were ch- I'm pretty sure they were they I'm sure pretty sure they were Chinese made. Um <laughs> if they have a but white I mean I I'd never if they uh, yeah, have these the have white a, label and the beige nozzles, they're Chinese made. They're kind of sooty, yeah. but boy, yeah. they're loud. The bees are very loud and very fun. Yeah. But the thing is, I, I I had always wanted to try a C65 because I mean, I, I you know, I'd heard that they burn longer than a, an S C65, and you know, I just the, those started to become difficult to find right after I got into the hobby, uh, yeah. and I had found. A website that had some and I, I didn't think they were going to be gone and I bookmarked it and eventually I was like I'm going to buy some of those and they were gone and uh, so you know I I, I, I I mean I like black powder motors I like that you can stage them but staging them is very easy right um, which I enjoy doing and it's more complicated with the composites composites are a lot of fun uh, yeah and I'm glad we've got both but I would that was never interesting uh, in my conversation with Dane Bowles last night, he said mm. because of the new composite engines, they had to take all take out the two stage Quest kits out of the catalog. Yeah, which I didn't even realize. Of course, I know you can't stage composites, but yeah, they they couldn't very easily, uh, you know, have two stage kits because they want to promote their engine use as opposed to buying yeah. an SS engine. No, I go back to composites. I've actually got some E twenty four seven Enerjet engines upstairs in a box, yeah. and I was. I mean, people say, "Oh, you fly composite." I was flying composites back in nineteen seventy five or whatever they came out, uh, which basically scared the hell out of me. It was exciting. I flew them in the Nike Smoke, the Enerjet Nike Smoke, and one of the features on the Nike Smoke was you loaded up this. It had a pitot pito tube. They had a BT-5 tube that ran down the inside. You cut off the end of the Nike smoke nose cone. Mm -hmm. And supposedly, it would intake and compress the air inside the nose cone and blow talcum powder out the side of one of those shield-shaped covers on the nose cone, which you opened up. And what basically happened to me was, I mean, I loaded up the, the talcum powder and stuck it on the launcher. I had my... My Interjet, my heavy-duty wooden Centuri launcher back then, I think it was an LIA-77. And I launched my Interjet engine, and all the smoke blew out of the nose cone in the first 50 feet of flight. And I'm sitting there in a cloud of white dust, and I couldn't even follow the rocket. <laughs> it was just like, oh, <laughs> where the hell did the rocket go? When Estes came out with their BT-60 base Nike smoke a few years ago, I made, it's on the blog, I, I cored out the inside of the body and tried to match the old Enerjet. I launched it with the B64, and it didn't even push the smoke out the side. Yeah, You may have to have a C5. I was going to say, regarding those old Chinese, there was somebody that did uh, thrust uh, some sort of analysis and found out, and I've launched those B64s, and they were mm-hmm. more powerful than the Estes B64s. Yeah. The C65s were long burning. I guess they burned yeah. for like four seconds. You couldn't put them in a heavy model. Right. Which no, is, they're lower thrust. And so, you know. Yeah. And you, you had deal to be careful. With, if you're dealing with one of the Schrocks, like a Schrock stiletto, and the website said C65s are okay, and you put a uh, Quest C, Chinese C65 in there, the rocket was lucky mm-hmm. to get 20 feet in the air and fall back to the ground. But yeah. with the right rocket, those things were incredible. Uh, this friend of mine, 
uh, Astron Mike, who does these really neat Depron, I think it's Depron foam wing boost lighters, pop pod boost lighters, and he gets these mm-hmm. incredible, lazy, long duration glides. He loved those uh, those Quest long burn C engines. He used those all yeah. the time. Bought them in bulk, I understand. So, yeah, I'm pretty fortunate to have clubs and a lot of rocketry friends. I think we do it more for the, we, we go out to launch rockets, but we also get together for lunch afterwards and talk more rockets and <laughs> drive their wives nuts that show up for the rocket launch. You know, how some much of us, take? For, for some of us, that's the main reason we go. So <laughs> <laughs> I always had a running joke. I was, I, I've done some dating on match.com. But if I met a girl on match and it got to dating over a couple months time, I'd have her over my place for a movie night or whatever. And she'd ask for a tour of the place. Well, I have to clean off the kitchen table, of course, and get rid of all the rocket junk. And if she got upstairs and saw, you know, of course, the guest bedroom and the guest bath, but if she ran, if she didn't run from the rocket room screaming, I knew I knew this one girl might work out. I took one one date to a rocket launch up at Nefar Club Launch, and I launched two rockets, low power, and she's watching the bit, high power stuff and was impressed by all of it. But I knew it wouldn't work out when she said, "How long do you normally stay at these launches?" And we were only there for forty five minutes at that point. Yeah, and I said, "Oh." We could head home now. And she goes, oh, good. I've got some things I've got to do. And I that didn't last. Well, well fortunately, fortunately, Mrs. Noob puts up with my rocketry pretty well. She, she's not that into it. She does like to go occasionally. And she's really yeah. good at holding a camera. She's great with a camera. Oh, she's good, good at, at uh, with with video. She's good at tracking, uh, tracking a rocket, not losing, not losing it in frame. And I used to be and I've gotten worse at it and so she hasn't come along with me for a while so i have no decent launch footage for the last year and a half two years well i just to see me at the schoolyard with my launcher set up my tripod i set up and i put my camera i've got an slr a 35 well it's not a 35 millimeter anymore but it's an slr and it shoots seven frames per second in burst mode yeah, and I'd love to get one that would do twelve frames per second, but they want a thousand dollars for them, and this was a four hundred dollar <laughs> camera. But yep. I can set the fr- the I can set the shutter speed at twenty five hundredths of a second, and usually capture something. Mm-hmm. So when I hit one, I've got the launch controller in my right hand and the camera in my left. No, it's the other way around. Camera in my right hand. And what I say out loud to myself, because there's nobody there, because they think I was nuts, but I, you know, I'll do three, two, one. I press down the shutter, it starts firing. And on launch, I press and hold the button and I just cross my fingers. But there's 20 shots taken and I may get, may get one out of it. Yeah, but I don't do any video because video, you don't get the resolution you normally would with a, you know, with a camera. Right. So. Yeah, and then there, you got to do video editing. There are these there are a few cameras that I've looked at that do they'll shoot in 4K and they have the option of selecting a frame from the 4K as a, as a still which there I think that most of the most of the ones that I looked at were a little more than I wanted to spend. Yeah. I do have a camera coming that's a, it's a it's a new action camera. Uh, it's called a um, Insta360 Go 2. And about three, we- three, four weeks ago, all of these photography YouTubers that I f- follow, on exactly the same day, they all featured this camera. It's this tiny little camera mm-hmm. that has really nice resolution and you can it, it, you can strap it to things. Like you can actually strap, there's a little mount that you can strap it to the strap on a baseball cap that you turn backwards on your head. Yeah. And it's got really good stabilization. And so what I'm hoping to do is I'm hoping that just by my watching a launch with that camera on my forehead, and it's really small, just by watching that launch that I might be able to actually keep things in frame. Wow. And uh, I'm pretty excited about it. The stabilization, they, they have, it has a feature called horizon lock, which 
means no matter which way you turn the camera, it's it's stays straight. And I I even saw a demonstration where somebody attached one to the wheel of a car and somebody walked along next to the car as the car was rolling. And despite the fact that the camera was turning turning over and over and over with the wheel of the car, the footage stayed rock steady. Wow. So I'm pretty I'm pretty excited about it. And I think it can do slow motion in lower resolution. Um and it's uh yeah, it's, well, it looks like a very exciting little camera. So I don't know if you can grab a still. I'll find out if I if you can grab a still from it that that looks alright. Well, right. you know I'm what really, you know what's next is they're going to have which they've got for like ice skating events because I used yeah. to videotape competitive ice skaters, mm-hmm. but I now they've got cameras that will follow a beacon on the that the ice skater puts on. Yeah. And the camera is is following it as motorized and stabilized and follows every move. So you don't have somebody jumping out of frame. With ice skating, you've got to anticipate where it's going to go. And with model rockets or any of the rockets, you've got to be pretty, pretty quick on the uptake when they're when they're going into their boost phase. It's yeah. easier when but even when they blow a parachute, it's like, okay, where is it in frame? Ah, okay, got it back. Yeah. It's really tough to follow. So I think that idea that following it with your brim of your hat, you know, right, following your safe movement as your head is going is is going to make it much easier. Yeah, I'm pretty excited to try it out. Years ago, I only I had a cam rock and got one picture that was sort of okay, the single shot cam rock. Mm-hmm. I had a center rock and I do still have a 16 millimeter that I think I transferred over to CD, but I only did one. But yeah. And that was on a single stage Omega. And it did turn out, you can see me down there with my 60, 63 Plymouth Rambler that I had connected up to the car battery uh, to launch it. And I did get a whole view of the Monterey Bay when I lived in California back then, which yeah. is pretty exciting. So that was successful. I'm curious about the new Estes uh, Astrocam which looks to be a pretty good resolution for such a small little, you know, pen camera. Yeah. I have seen some, some, uh, video and even some, some frame grabs that look pretty decent, uh, for that little camera. Um, it's, I, the rocket itself, I'm not that crazy about, I'm just not that crazy about ready to fly rockets. Um, but I imagine if it's the right BT size, you could, you could build one or you could put you know, put it on a different kit if you wanted to. Um, well, the, you know what? I mean, that's really what market they're going for. I mean, Estes yeah. is always, you got to figure that if you sell five starter kits, one out of those five is going to go back and buy more engines and different rockets. Yeah. Uh, and that's, I, and I can totally understand their, their marketing on it. Uh, the tube, I understand, I don't have the model, but it's, if it's one of those, pre-colored tubes, they tend to be a little, they feel a little thinner than a BT-50, but all you got to do is buy a BT-50H mm-hmm. and you've got a really solid model to launch that thing with. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if they're going to offer the camera separately down the road. I haven't heard anything one way or the other on it, but I think it's a good platform and a good vehicle for it. And of course, the nose cone when you see the Mars Snooper, there's, I could tell you this much, there are some brand new nose cones in the Mars yeah. Snooper kit. And it, it's an incredible expense to come up with these molds because I've checked into it for <laughs> custom nose cones. Oh, somebody has to come out with a ramjet, a plastic ramjet nose cone that's not 3D printed. Right. Uh, yeah, stuff like that I've looked into, but it's cost prohibitive for such a small run that I would need. But anyway, but Estes is coming out with a lot of new stuff that looks to be, I don't want to use the word proprietary, but you can only use it in that one model. So a lot of people, every time someone talks to Estes, a lot of people are always like, when are you going to bring back this? When are you going to bring back that? And I understand why people do that. I imagine it probably drives them a little nuts to constantly hear, when are you going to bring this back? Because, you know, they have to go into the future. It's not just about pleasing the old timers. It's also about bringing in new blood. But I tell you what, if they put a digital camera on a bring back of the Cinerock 
that thing would probably just take off like lightning. It, everybody's got their favorite rocket. When I got back yeah. into the hobby, one of the first rockets I bought from Semrock was the Centuri Javelin. That was my first model rocket. Yeah. And I had to have my first rocket. It still sits on the shelf. It's never been flown. Everybody's got their favorite. If you bring back a model like the, the new one, the Super Mars Snooper, it's going to satisfy the guys that are, you know, are 50 and up that built this model when they were in their teens. Plus, it's going to be a good size for and a, and a fun build. Oh, you know, it's not an easy build by any stretch. It's not a beginner build, I should say. But it's also going to satisfy people looking for something that looks space agey. 50, yeah. 60 space agey. I can totally understand bringing back the Saturn 1B in the 1100 scale format because it matches the Saturn V they've had out since, what, 1969. It, it matches the scale as opposed to the 170th scale four-engine cluster model. So there's, there's methods to, their, to what they're bringing out and how they're bringing it out. They know what sells. They also know they've got to uh, produce almost ready-to-flies for those first-time builders to give them a yeah. feeling of satisfaction. It's very exciting to see models when they're pre-production. That's what I'm doing now. And I get to make a build comment commentary to say, this could be a concern here. There's a mistake in the instructions here. Uh, I got to be careful how I say and what I say. But uh, yeah. they, they seem to be very receptive because it's like working at a print shop. Ten people can read over a book and it's going to be some it's going to be the customer that comes back and says, you spelt my name wrong. It goes by everybody because you're so used to seeing it. But there is, getting back, there is, there is a good method to what Estes and Centur, excuse me, and what Quest is bringing back. They, they're, they're on the right track. Yeah, and, no, I think they're doing a great job. And I, I'm very pleased with the, the new, own, we keep saying the new ownership, it's been a few years now, but, you know, I think they are in, they're having a renaissance, basically. I think yeah. the whole hobby's having a renaissance, uh, and particularly Estes. We were saying we're in the golden age of rocketry seven or eight years ago, but mm -hmm. even more so now. Yeah. I mean, I knew, I, I knew John Langford back when he was part of the Langford, the Beedra and Langford scale, you know, competitive team back in 74, 75. These, mm -hmm. This team used to build incredible competition and scale models. And now John Langford, you know, bought Estes and his son is the, you know, the CEO of Estes. I think that's the right title, but he's, you know, he's the president of Estes. And yeah. Bill Stein, you know, is CEO or vice president. I don't know the titles. I should have had Bill's card pulled out here. <laughs> but I, I knew all these guys in passing way back yeah. when. And they are heading into, with the reintroduction of the C5-3 engine, which is needed. It's great. Models, it's great. Yeah, bigger models, heavier models need that extra impulse at boost. Yeah. At ignition. And there's more fun stuff on the way, as I understand. So yep. keep your eyes out. Keep an eye on the on the web pages and the and the websites because it we're really heading into, I think, the new golden age. I agree. I wasn't there for the last one, but just just the the just the things that are available to do. I mean, you know, tiny little electronic altimeters. Instead yeah. of, you know, using an alti track or, a, you know, or theodolites oh. for tr tracking and, you know, the wide variety of composite motors. And I, I think I think this and, and little now little tiny cameras that you can just tape to the side of the rock if you want to. Yeah. The um, 808s, I, I used them all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I think they're great. And I think I think it is really uh, and it is a golden age. And my, personally, I, I, I try to, without being obnoxious about it, I try to <laughs> tell people about this hobby. If the opportunity presents itself, people who are not involved in the hobby, because I think that's, I think model rocketry used to have a higher visibility in the general public yeah. during the sixties and seventies and maybe the eighties. And Myself, when I discovered that this this hobby was still around, I I thought it had gone extinct. I didn't think it existed anymore. And I'll tell yeah, you an interesting ahead. story. When I was at Narum sixty, which was the last Narum I went to, and which was the one to go to because the Peasters were there, the, 
Byrne and Glita Estes were there. I mean, everybody that was in the hobby way back when was there. Yeah. And it was a great chance to rekindle old friendships. And weren't you the guy that did such and such? I mean, you talk to a guy and realize you're chatting with Larry Ranger, the guy that designed the Sky Slash and the Falcon for Estes. I, it, it was just a kick. Yeah. Anyway, when I was there, I bought my Estes ball cap with the Estes logo on the front. And I wear it occasionally. It's not something I, I didn't brag that or brag. I didn't boast that I was building a rockets and playing a banjo in high school because I never would have been able to talk to a girl beyond five minutes. You know, they would have looked at me as a <laughs> rocket banjo playing rocket nerd. Oh, well, boy. now I wear the hat and I could care less what anybody thinks about what I did for a living and that yeah. I fly rockets. Well, I went to a podiatrist. And the podiatrist says, that logo looks really familiar. And I said, oh, that's mm -hmm. uh, Estes Model Rockets. And he goes, are they still around? I said, yeah. And I gave yeah. him a couple, I gave him my card with a couple web addresses on it. And he went out with his son. He was probably 50 something. He went out with his son and they came to club launches. And I went back for a return uh, appointment and he didn't charge me for the appointment. So there, there's some of that. And the same thing happened when I went to a dermatologist one time. And she said, no, there's, thanks for all the, no charge. This has been a lot of fun. Because I, you know, she, I went to your website and looked up and saw your pig rockets and we're going to order a pig. And, you know, and so rocketry is, it is kind of paying for itself now, which is, yeah. is, is exciting. And it's amazing just that hat, how many people you know, put two and two together and it starts up mm -hmm. a conversation and it's opened up the door to a lot more people getting back in the hobby. So, yeah, yeah you it, know, I, I, I am in the same situation. I, I don't ever talk about what my actual day job is on the show, but mm -hmm. uh, I'll just say, I'll just say I'm required to wear a hat. I have to wear a hat, which is mm -hmm. kind of a new thing. And, uh, I, I wear my Estes hat. I actually have two of them. One of them is, uh, I, I have the good one, which is nice and clean. And I have the old beat up one. So the good one is for like, you know, weddings, bar mitzvahs. It's my formal yeah. hat. And then I have yeah. the casual hat, yeah. um, but I wear it. I wear it every day. And about once every week or two, somebody says, Hey, I used to do that. Or is that, is that the rocket thing, you know? And so then we get to have a conversation about it. And, yeah. you know, I, I actually, it's, it's funny because I need to print up some cards because I want to give people, you know, I say, yeah, you can just Google me. It's, I, I'm like, you can I do a podcast called the model rocket show. Or you can just look up rocket noob and you'll, you should find me, whatever. But I need to print up some cards because I really want to get more people aware of the hobby and, and I have plans when things are a little less crazy with COVID and everything to build a display for the local library uh, on right. model rocketry. And, you know, it's, 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 it is just, it's beneficial to us in the hobby and it's beneficial to other people to have the hobby be uh, more visible. I mean, for one thing, we have a really excellent safety record. I was uh, just going to say that, that's the one thing we have to stress in the displays that it's a it's a safe hobby if done it's, if done if following the safety code. Exactly, it's a it's a safe hobby. We have sixty plus years of of an excellent safety record, and I think back in the sixties and seventies, you know, you would go to a if you go to a park, you launch some model rockets. People knew what model rocketry was, and even if they didn't do it themselves, it was no big deal. Well, these yeah. days, it's so sort of an invisible hobby, and I've heard the occasional story of. You know, somebody goes to the park with their kids and flies model rockets and some neighbor thinks, you know, oh, I've had doesn't know what's good. Yeah. And calls the police and the police show up and yep. they don't know what you're doing and they don't know if it's legal or illegal. And, you know, it's a whole mess. And it's like, uh, you know, I, and I've I've looked up. The, we have a lot of parks where I live right now. I've looked up the local statutes. There's nothing about model rocketry on there. there Until is you one show up. Until I show up. Right. So I don't want to be. So I what I want to do is I want to make people in my community. I want to get first of all, get to know people because it's hard yeah. to get to know people around here. I want to make people aware through the library, through just, you know, interpersonal connections of what's going on, you know, and what this hobby is and how it's safe and everything. So that at some point I can go to a park and I don't get the cops called on me and then have the city council say no model rockets in this town. <laughs> 
<laughs> because well, one thing I do carry you know, with me when I when I re up the NAR, and you can if anybody got away from the hobby for years like I did and back into it, you could request your old NAR number. You don't have yeah. if you don't, they'll assign you a the new number, which are up in the hundred and I don't know, ten thousand twenty thousandth now. And my yeah. my old NAR number is nineteen thousand eighty six one nine zero oh one nine zero eight six. But when I re upped, they sent out a flyer that explained what the NAR is and the insurance, and I folded that in two and stick it in my launch box. And one day I was at the schoolyard. I go out at seven a.m. before the wind picks up, mm-hmm. and I'm launching little A eight threes and maybe a B six four and a big Bertha style model. Nothing that goes that high, but just to keep things active and give you something to talk about on the blog. And the police rolled up. I thought, oh yeah. crap, here it comes. And the guy came over and said, oh, you're launching some rockets. And I said, yeah. He goes, yeah, I used to do this years ago when I pulled out my NAR information. I said, yeah, I'm following the safety code. I've got, you know, a couple million dollars of insurance provided through the NAR. Uh, This is a, this property is owned by the Homeowners Association, which I contribute to. I'm not coming in from the outside. I live in the neighborhood. And I said, hey, do you want to launch one? He said, can I? So... (laughs) Yeah. It got me through that, you know, the, yeah. the one time when the police came out. And I can't blame people, but I'm thinking, here I am launching you know. a little rocket with a parachute. And Fourth of July and New Year's, there's people launching these illegal fireworks and nobody gets yeah. called on those, just banging and booming till one thirty in the morning. So there's a little hypocrisy there, yeah. but... Yeah, and I, but I think it. I think people, when people are unaware of this hobby and unaware of the, the safety record of the hobby... You know, it looks crazy if you're not familiar with it. It look, I mean, these things fly fast. They fly high. They use fire. You know, it, it's uh, we know we know that it's safe. We know that it's it's a it's a hobby that was created for children. But yeah. if you're not familiar with it, that's why I think it's beneficial to us to spread awareness. Now, where I used to live back in Bloomington, Indiana, I knew everybody. I knew the mayor. I knew yeah. the deputy mayor. I knew police officers and fire off fire firefighters. And, you know, that no one was going to call the police if I went launching model rockets in Bloomington, which is not that different from Newton where I live. I mean, it's there. There are some differences, obviously, but nobody knows me here. And in Newton, it's illegal to throw a snowball in a park. <laughs> oh, that's how safety conscious they are. Somebody um, got hurt. It, it, all, yeah, it takes, well, all it takes is one idiot with a fuse <laughs> and somebody listen, there was scraping, a, scraping sparklers. There were, and, uh. Well, there was, a, there, was a, there was an infamous snowball fight at Harvard back in the 1800s with rocks, and oh, it got really messy. I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but basically, yeah. So that's why I'm trying to like spread some awareness before I venture out. You know, yeah. I mean, there is a there is a town nearby where our club flies all the time. I can go over there, no problem, and fly fly rockets if I, you know, on my day off if I want to. But I'd kind of like to go to the park that's a two minute walk from my house if I could, because and I could, but I'm not. I don't know that there wouldn't be some trouble if nobody well, what, understood what I was doing. So that's what why I, bought, I think it's. I'm sorry. What I bought in this my townhouse. Uh, in 2005, I've been here just over 15 years. When I bought here, I I saw this play area, the soccer, which back then was just an open field. It wasn't divided up into soccer fields. And I thought, gee, that looks like a good B64 field, maybe a mm-hmm. C6 engine in a saucer field. And it has since been picked up by the elementary school. That's their PE field. That's why I've got to go over early in the day. By yeah. the time of nine in the morning, you got to be off that field so they can use it for a school field. But that was part of my plan was one of the reasons I bought here is I had a schoolyard that if I ever got mm-hmm. a dog, I could run my dog. I can launch some rockets. I mean, it's something you've got to consider because flying fields are getting farther and farther away and yep. harder to come by. But it all, like I said, it's, it's my old shop teacher. When he found out some of the gang members were sniffing paint, you know, in the finishing room in the eighth grade, he said, because of the inconsideration of a few, all of us must suffer. 
meaning yeah. some idiot screwed it up for the rest of us. So the whole idea of spreading the safety, the safety side of it, say, and it's beyond just safe and sane, which is what used to be printed on fireworks in California, is is definitely something that, you know, because we, we should be talking about. And it's, like I said, it's only going to get better where people are, some people resort to using a lit fuse when the igniters don't work. The igniters are going to be getting improving. I mean, there, there's a lot of things in the works to make it a better hobby. <laughs> well, Chris Michelson, uh, thank you so much for coming to talk to me. And uh, it was great meeting you at Narcon a few years ago. I hope we get to meet again when uh, travel is less, you know, yeah. fatal. <laughs> <laughs> it's <Yeah>. less dangerous. <laughs> um, it's, things are getting better. We're we're, yeah. we're we're almost there. We're almost there. I can feel it. So, Fingers crossed. Yeah, we're so, we're looking forward to COVID being over and Orlando Rock can go back to our state park launching field again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, yeah. Ho- hope hope we get to meet again at an Archon or some other function. And yeah. uh, thanks very much, Chris. You bet, Daniel. Thank you. And thanks to CG, too. Appreciate your help. All right. That is the Model Rocket Show at themodelrocketshow.com. Thanks so much, Chris Michelson, for coming on. I am your host, The Rocket Noob. You can email me at noob at themodelrocketshow.com. That's N-0-0-B at themodelrocketshow.com. I don't check my email every day, uh, and I get a lot of spam. So uh, you may have ended up in spam folder. I'm not ignoring you, I promise. But you can always reach out to me, noob, at themodelrocketshow.com. If you have a question, if you have a uh, suggestion for a show topic or a guest, uh, that'd be always fun. And you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Rocket Noob, which I don't post very often, but I do sometimes. And sometimes it's funny, and sometimes it's pictures of rockets. Also, my blog is rocketnoob.blogspot.com. And again, I don't post on there very often, but when I do, uh, well, you can read it there. All right. We got another episode coming in, in two weeks. It's going to be Randy Bodeway of erockets.biz and Semrock. It's going to be a fun show. Catch you next time. This show is brought to you by the support of our sponsors and listeners. If you wish to support the show for just a few dollars a month, Please become a patron by visiting patreon.com slash The Rocketry Show. Don't forget to check out our sister show, TheRocketryShow.com, a program that is all about advanced and high-power rocketry. The views and opinions expressed on these programs are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Little Beth Entertainment or its sponsors.